Please welcome our panelists, Chairman of Greater Asia at APCO Worldwide, James McGregor, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Asia Society, Kevin Brudd, Editor-in-Chief of the South China Morning Post, Tammy Tam, and our moderator, member of the Bloomberg Editorial Board, Nisid Hajari. Good morning, everyone. I think uh, those of you who were at the dinner last night um, will have heard uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson give a fairly unvarnished, full-throated indictment of one-man rule, uh, particularly in reference to Russia and China. Uh, he brought up an argument that many have, have made that if you have a leader who is surrounded by what some would consider yes-men, uh, lackeys, people who don't have either the power or the will or the inclination to push back against bad ideas, that those bad ideas, if, they're, if, they, uh, if the leader wants to push them forward, continue on and expand and, and uh, can have unfortunate consequences. Um, I think markets feared something like this after the 20th National Party Congress in China last month. Uh, they worried that uh, Xi Jinping's uh, sidelining of any potential rivals meant a continuation of policies such as the COVID zero policy, continuation of a, a sort of crackdown on the private sector, a continuation of a more belligerent uh, foreign policy, our attitude towards neighbors and towards the United States, um, and markets tanked uh, the day after the, the Congress ended. But in the last few weeks, uh, we've seen something a little different. We've seen uh, some relaxation of, of the COVID curbs. We have seen some uh, more support for the property sector. We have seen the meeting with President Biden in Bali, which seemed to put a floor under the uh, relationship, sorry, between the, uh, the decline in the relationship between the U.S. and China. Um, and markets have responded swiftly and joyously and uh, anticipating a, a more pragmatic approach from, from China. Uh, so to help us figure out which is the right uh, way to think about China, we have a wonderful panel here. I just want to say one thing. If, we will have some time for questions from the audience, so if you have any, please uh, file them through the app, and I will get them up here, and I'll try and post them to the columnists. I'm sorry, the <laughs> panelists. Uh, so, Kevin, maybe I can start with you. Um, you've written after the Party Congress that the changes that we saw in Beijing represent sort of the return of ideological man to, to China. Uh, that, that Xi Jinping is driven by party doctrine more than anything else. Um, has anything in the past few weeks that China has done or said changed, made you rethink that thesis? Good. The, um, first of all, just thanking uh, Mike and the team for, the, um, for uh, this initiative over four years now. When you think about when this was established, I was just saying this to Mike as he left the room back in 2019, it was the beginning of the gathering storm in US-China relations. That was already the beginning of year two of the US-China trade war, before the pandemic and for the general implosion in the US-China strategic relationship. So the fact that this has ticked along for the last four years, uh, leading up to, if you like, the partial rapprochement in Bali the other day, says a lot to the wisdom which underpinned the establishment of this gathering, and at least having a forum where the two sides can speak. On your question about the 20th Party Congress, picture left, um, the, um, uh, not a big sense of humour on the part of uh, the attendees. Um, but uh, if you read carefully the Congress report, which actually becomes the Bible for the next five years, that's why we, in the China analytical game, read these things carefully, because they establish the ideological parameters for what's acceptable and what's not for the period ahead. I see two or three messages... Um, one is that Xi Jinping's resolve to continue to harden down on his own personal Leninist control of the party remains undiminished mm -hmm. and is continuing. He is now the paramount leader without question. And so on any question about uh, the future of US-China relationship or where the economy ultimately goes, uh, he is decision maker number one, two and three. We just need to get used to that fact. Um, Secondly, on the economy, if you look at the settings put in place since the 19th Party Congress, on, you see this increasing movement back towards the party state, back towards the state-owned sector, back away from uh, privately owned tech platforms, and you see a new direction in support of common prosperity 
or what the document refers to as a new regulation on wealth accumulation, quote unquote. We don't know what that means yet. And so when I say there's been some move towards the Marxist left over the last five years, it's not just a term we pluck out of space. We look at the key language and themes of the document, and this is the way in which it's read internally by the system. So I think that is still the case. On the economy, though, I'll just add one point. And that is, you're correct to point out that um, since the Congress, a couple of things have happened. Um, some relaxation on the property sector, but not on the tech platforms. Um, secondly, um, what I think has been an inevitable crab walking away from zero COVID or dynamic zero COVID, uh, as we begin to experiment in the mainland with what I think is the Hong Kong model uh, through cities in Guangdong and elsewhere, get to the summer next year, barring a new variation of the pandemic that we've just not dreamt of yet, and I think China will, by mid-year, be well on its way to being out of this. And that will have a huge positive impact on domestic consumer demand, which has been suppressed now for a very long period of time. So they're the two big exceptions to the general thesis I advanced. And the last bit is in terms of the foreign and security policy direction, all I'd say is the document is still hardline in China's determination to achieve its uh, great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, hardline on the question of Taiwan, and most importantly, what I see is new language about China's increasingly adversarial external strategic environment. So that's what we see in the Congress, mm -hmm. but I see a bit of light on the economy, and I see a bit of light in terms of the short to medium term on US-China relations as evidenced in the summit the other day between Biden and Xi Jinping. Excellent. I want to come back to that in a minute. But um, Tammy, maybe I can ask you, um, what do you see in, in, the, in the, um, the document that Kevin was talking about, particularly as regards Hong Kong? Do you see any signs of, of hope or relaxation there? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure and my honor to be invited here. And Kevin, I'm very glad that you mentioned Hong Kong. Um, since I'm a journalist, I think I, instead of talking about my own text, uh, I think I would like to offer some of my observations from a journalistic perspective. So when it comes to the Party Congress and something, some, this is the, the biggest political event in China uh, for journalists, usually we'll see what's new. So what's the news angle? So when it comes to the party congress and the political reports and the past party constitutional uh, amendments, so I no we noticed the number one new stuff is that the part about Hong Kong is the longest when it compared to all the previous party congress. In the past, the Hong Kong part, actually I cannot call it Hong Kong part, Maybe there's only one or two sentences about Hong Kong, basically, that, oh, the Communist Party will stick to the one country, two systems. Uh, by the way, one country, two, two systems is the special governing model promised by Beijing, uh, under which Hong Kong will remain our capitalist system, we have our own legal system, our own currency, blah, 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 blah. So, but this time, not only in his opening address, there's a long paragraph about Hong Kong, and also in the amendment of the Party Congress, in front of this sentence of uh, sticking to one country, two systems, there are three adjectives added into that, which is the Communist Party will carry out the one country, two systems in a comprehensive way, accur accurate way, and also unwavering. So, so what does it mean to, to Hong Kong or, or to the world? To me, I see two strategic significance there. So that's also how my media organizations, we talk, reach out to experts at home and abroad and, and, and also business sectors in Hong Kong and then to get their feedback. Number one, uh, Hong Kong will remain as a strategic buffer instead of a, a, a battleground between China and US. And when Xi Jinping said clearly in his report that this one country, two systems has been prov proven as the, the right way forward and will be maintained for a long time 
even though he did not elaborate how long is long. So to many of those experts that we have talked to, their common agreement, common consensus is this will go beyond 50 years. Mm. 50 years of one country, two system was promised by the late paramount Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping, and it was written into Hong Kong's basic law, which is Hong Kong's uh, mini constitution. And the, the, the deadline, the timeline, the deadline is supposed to be by 2047, 50 years, and Hong Kong we just celebrated our 25th anniversary, so we're in the middle. Uh, for some business people, if they want to make long-term commitment and they, they want to have a longer-term kind of uh, business planning in Hong Kong, already there are some people they started to, to, to query and to wonder, so if I want to sign a contract by 2047, will Hong Kong become one country, one system, which is the socialist system? Will this contract still be recognized by the, the Hong Kong or the mainland government by that time? So this is a long, long time commitment from Xi he himself and also from the party constitution. Party constitution is very significant. If you want to change it, it's not for the leader, he himself, whoever that leader will be at the time, it must get the consensus of the, the, the whole party, at least the, the central committee. So this is beyond 2047, it's very significant. Another detail I would like to mention here to share with the audience here is um, she, when he visited Hong Kong uh, by, by, by late June and, and made his uh, uh, important speech uh, in Hong Kong on July the 1st, for the very first time by a Chinese leader, top leader, he make it, he make it public. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong's common law system will be there to stay for a long time as well. When it comes to Hong Kong's legal system, the common law system is very important because that's how differentiate Hong Kong from the mainland legal system. And um, under the common law system, it's not just you know, uh, taking to the court or to, to have some sort of uh, you know, uh, judgments on, on certain criminal cases. Under different, uh, this is a British, uh, we, we, we inherited this from the, the British. It also provides a lot of business opportunities. So one latest development was, um, I think it was uh, about 10 days ago, the Chinese Foreign Ministry just made an official announcement. They are going to set up an office in Hong Kong and work together with the Hong Kong government to turn Hong Kong into an international arbitration or mediation center under the common law systems. Uh, and that's quite significant. We know that um, there is a very big arbitration center in London and also here in Singapore as well. But for those business people, if you have business deals with uh, mainland China or has any kind of uh, Chinese capitals in, in the business deals, in the future, if there are any business disputes, um, probably Hong Kong is the, the best place for them to go because uh, this arbitration center is under the common law system. Uh, London may be too far away, and with due respect to Singapore, probably uh, Singapore uh, has its uniqueness, but Hong Kong is uh, our connection with uh, mainland China. I think that will help. Uh, I think that that's, that's how we see Hong Kong in, in the years to come. I, and also, uh, it's only under one country, two systems, can Hong Kong gave up the so-called political correctness that before we, our border were open to the mainland, we cannot open to the outside world. Mm -hmm. So actually, a couple of months ago, the Hong Kong government already started to introduce our own, Hong Kong's own anti-pandemic uh, measures. Mm -hmm. So by now, we are already open to the outside world. We allow inbound travelers to come to Hong Kong with zero quarantine, so only three days under the so-called um, medical surveillance. Actually, you can go anywhere except you cannot go to a restaurant, which is uh, considered as a high-risk venue. But probably you can, if you like Chinese food, you can still yeah. order takeaway. <laughs> yeah. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Jim, let me, let me bring you in here. Uh, on this question of reassurance, yeah. right? Um, you know, markets can afford to be driven to a certain extent by sentiment, but businessmen who are, 
invest, planning to invest, building factories, hiring workers, um, need a little more confidence, right? So, so what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is probably not enough to change their minds about, about China right now. What, did, what would they need to see from this new Chinese government to really reassure them that well, I, you know, I work with a lot of uh, foreign companies in China, and uh, I can tell you they are just dreaming of having the technocrats come back. You know, they're just hope upon hope for some practicality. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, you know, look, at, look what's come out of the Congress, and it's been lined up in recent years, is basically two major economic policies. One, common prosperity, which Kevin has talked about. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at the wealth gap. I mean, the wealth gap in China is, is huge. It's also aimed at um, the party does not want money to have power. They do not want capital to have power. And I don't, I'm not sure they're going to be that happy with businesses getting large. But they also want people to, they want Chinese people investing in chips and new materials, not in, tic, not in games and, and, and toys. Mm -hmm. On the other side, what really affects foreign companies is dual circulation. Mm -hmm. Dual circulation is all about hardening the Chinese economy for long-term hostility from the outside world. And it's, it's I mean, it, it's like all these slogans you have. Dual circulation means basically making China less dependent on the world, so having uh, high-end supply chains come in, fewer things crossing borders, um, you know, developing chips and you know, all of the technology they want to do. Um, but it's also about making um, the outside world more dependent on China in a strategic way. So that big companies will have enough market share that they're going to go to Brussels and Beijing I and mean, Washington and say, you know, be nice to China, which you know, the, the, uh, the, the bankers are already doing. Um, but the, what it boils down to is there's two kinds of foreign companies in China today, those that China needs and those that need China. And uh, you better be very clear on which one of those you on because it, it's all about leverage. Mm -hmm. um, now... The, the opportunities in China for companies that have technology, high-end um, materials, what, uh, business processes, even, even consumer goods that Chinese people like because they want the growth to come out of the domestic economy. You know, all these sanctions and tariffs and cross-border problems, they want, that, that's woken China up to we have to be, we have to be uh, strong in, in, internally. But companies have lost faith in China. I mean, they've lost faith in China, and China has to restore more than talking about things. They've got to see actions. Mm. Uh, there has not been retribution, really, against companies r so far because they don't want them to leave. Mm. But one thing that is happening because of COVID, and I think also just because of the tight political atmosphere, there's an expat exodus. The foreigners have left China. And so the multinationals are now run by, mo mostly by Chinese nationals. Mm -hmm. And these people are hardworking, smart, loyal. I'm not saying anything against them. But they're also Chinese, and, and they, they figure that the, the, the system, they'll be more amenable to understanding the system and working with the system than some guy from Duluth, Minnesota, right? right. Uh, and so uh, there's a profound change. But what's also happening is you've got, um, you've got an ideological difference. It always used to be uh, that the headquarters in China would see more opportunities and want to move ahead faster, and headquarters would often be reading headlines and have look at liability and risk. We used to say you would fight China by day and headquarters by night. Um, now it's, uh, there's an ideological divide because the, the China offices and the headquarters, with COVID, they're not mixing, they're not traveling back and forth, they're not having cocktails together. And, um, and also... Um, the Chinese managers have a different view. They've grown up in a different place. Um, they have a different sets of information. Mm -hmm. Taiwan, South China Sea, human rights. And, and people are actually taking all the criticism on human rights personally. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, that you're looking down on me as being Chinese and the propaganda in China is very good at reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. And they think, well, you're looking at my human rights. How many school shootings did you have this week? Mm -hmm. And so companies now have to really work on having better communications with their offices in China. CEOs need to talk one-on-one -on -one to their managers there instead of in these, on a group Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And also, just one other thing, on government relations, you now need to be cross-border. You can't have China government relations 
America, Europe. Mm -hmm. They have to be cross-border because companies are facing sanctions and, and problems from all angles now involving their China business. So the world's got more complicated. But back to my original point, um, if China starts showing technocrats who are focused on getting things done. Because remember, why did China work so well? Because the, the officials out in the provinces and the cities could be entrepreneurial. They, they, they often came up with the policies that worked, and then Beijing would spread them around. It did lead to more than a little bit of corruption uh, now and then also. Um, but now in the last decade, it's become more and more top-down where they, 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 you know, they'll hear a whisper from, from the top and they'll overreact on the bottom because they don't want to do the wrong thing. If that, if that top-down Leninism complete system continues, it's going to be very hard to have the flexibility to run an economy um, um, that's going to be able to be international. Mm. Do you Kevin, do you think Xi Jinping, having accumulated all this power, having centralized all this power, will be able to free up lower-level officials to be more entrepreneurial again? Well, it used to be a great saying in China, which is, 上有政策, 下有对策, which is, <laughs> above we have policies and below they have counter-policies. In other words, whatever you dream of in Beijing, we will screw you on the ground. Yeah. Okay? And there's a, there's a noble history of that which predates the communist period. Um, now you've got uh, exactly what we've just been talking about, which is, 上有政策, uh, 下有... <laughs> which is above we have policies and below because I don't want to get into trouble with the center I'm going to be more Catholic than the Pope mm -hmm. in implementing uh, these uh, these policies and over correcting so the problem uh, with a system where political power is concentrated absolutely at the center is that it does systemically discourage free, candid, and open policy advice within the system. Now, the open question is whether this new team at the Standing Committee of the Politburo, led by uh, new Premier Li Chang, uh, is going to have sufficient political standing with Xi Jinping to say the move towards the state away from the market, the move towards SOEs away from the private sector, is damaging fundamentally our growth numbers, and we therefore must adjust this growth model. If he can do that, uh, then China once again will prove its critics wrong and will therefore recapture growth. If he doesn't do that, then you've got to ask yourself, where does the next increment of Chinese growth come from? It's not a piece of magic here. It's like any other economy. Does it come from private domestic consumption? Well, once COVID restrictions are lifted, as I said before, there'll be a lift in private domestic consumption. Um, but at the same time, people are hampered by the cost of living, hampered by the cost of childcare, by the cost of aged care, by the cost of education care, and uh, frankly, real disposable incomes have been flatlining for some time. So some positive news on consumption, but tempered by other structural factors, private fixed capital investment another historical huge driver of growth and through it productivity. Uh, these guys are all hiding under a mattress at the moment because they're, not, they're very uncertain about the investment environment and we speak to these folks all the time. Then you've got private residential construction, mm. slow recovery, so small tick there. Then you've got net exports, mm -hmm. the fourth big driver of growth. Next year we're going to have probably a recession in the developed world. Problem, therefore, if that's to be your principal growth engine next year, then you're left with what I call old faithful, which is state investment. And if you ratchet state investment down again through more levels of government borrowing when debt to GDP is already at 317%, you're racking up future systemic problems. So Li Chang, the new premier and the economic team, have to, in my judgment, unleash private fixed capital investment in order to build the next wave of productivity growth. And that means doing something which ideologically is counterintuitive, which is to provide more space for the private sector rather than less. Can I just interject here? The, the analysis of the, of the new standing committee has been pretty straightforward that these are she acolytes. Mm -hmm. 
Three of them were former chiefs of staff or current chief of staff. But it's much deeper than that. These are also very experienced people. Mm. I mean, Li Chang ran Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and Shanghai. Mm. Um, you know, they, and so she, there's, there's, a, there's also a possibility that she now has people he trusts. And, you know, he's made himself the chairman of everything, so he had to get rid of anybody that could say he's not the chairman of everything. So if he trusts these people, then they may be able to move ahead and do things, and they really have no choice. The economy is the worst in 30 years. And they not only have to regain the confidence of the business community, they got to regain the confidence of Lao Baixing, the Chinese people who are living in lockdowns, rolling lockdowns and tests, and they are, they're a very unhappy group of people right now, and they aren't spending money. And the thing about a, a consumer economy, you can't order people to spend. They have to have confidence. So I think, there's, I think it's going to move ahead with some economic reforms that, are, that we're not expecting out of necessity, out of necessity, even if they don't want. Uh, long term, it's more ideological. They, can, they better do something or that economy is going to be in real trouble. It already is. A footnote on that is the Central Economic Commission meeting next month in December. Mm -hmm. This will be the first proof point right. as to whether pragmatism pushes back against ideology mm -hmm. or whether ideology overcomes pragmatism. And so we'll be looking very carefully at the granular outcome of the report mm -hmm. from the Central Economic Commission conference, which uh, annual conference, which would be in mid-December. Right, right. I just want to chip in a bit. Uh, actually, I agree with both of you. Uh, when people are talking about, oh, right now it's a, a, a group of uh, loyalists uh, surrounding Xi, but I agree with Jim's comments. When you have a team that you have 100% trust, probably you can delegate more and there will, there will be a bigger room for them to maneuver. And Kevin, you're talking, you, you talk about uh, the future Premier Li Chang. Um, after the, you know, the, 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 the new lineup, uh, we talked to people who once worked with him or who have connection, direct connection with him. The common feedback was quite surprising. People talk about how business friendly he is. And, uh, to Hong Kong people in particular, and there was a, he, he also has a, a Hong Kong connection. He got his uh, master degree in management in Hong Kong. Uh, in, in Hong Kong. Um, so that also comes back to um, Hong Kong again. I want to raise one more point and put things into context. So for Beijing's uh, long-term view on Hong Kong and how the, the positioning for Hong Kong, I do see they don't want to turn it into the battleground. And, and one example was last year, this time, uh, when the U United States imposed sanctions against uh, you know, Hong Kong senior officials, including our former chief executive and also uh, the current chief executive who was at that time in charge of the crackdown of the protest. So um, in Beijing, Beijing was uh, mulling for an antitrust law and we got prepared to, to cover that and we talked to business people in Hong Kong and all are so worried because with this attack for attack antitrust law, it will be very, very difficult for people to do business in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is a financial center, business center, including some of these, uh, you know, interestingly, Chinese companies based in Hong Kong, they all express their concerns uh, you know, via their own channels to Beijing, right? So at last minute, just ahead of the uh, National People's Congress Standing Committee, which is China's uh, highest legislature, to convene its Standing Committee meeting just a day ahead, we suddenly we noticed that antitrust law was not on the agenda of that meeting. It was pushed aside. So later on, we found out it, it was uh, understood someone from the very top put the brick on that because they understand if you have to introduce this uh, anti sanction law, how can, how can Hong Kong be maintained as a financial center? Because all the transactions, or, or the majority of the transactions, they are in US dollar. Just, it's just impossible. So, so this is a one background I want to share with uh, the audience. Uh, and then I think after all, it's all economy that matters for China, for the new leadership. Uh, we understand that in China... I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're politicians, first yeah. and foremost. Yeah, yeah, it's I, both. I, it's a political economy. I, I think no, that, that's, uh, 
my point, uh, the next point is that we all understand in China, mainland China, there's no general election, there's no election in the, uh, as the, the Western type of democracy. So where does the legitimacy of the Communist Party's rule come from? I think the party, they, they know, it comes from support from the people. If you screw up the economy, I mean, people will... Uh, you, you see rebellions, uh, it just cannot govern. I, I, this is how we, we see this, and, and that's how when we talk to economists, uh, politicians, academics in mainland China, I think the, 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 the common sense is that the Communist Party's priority, besides ideology, of course, there's, there's something, and communism, communism uh, ideology, but economy still matters very much. That's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, let me, let me come back to uh, the U.S., the Biden-Xi meeting. Yeah. Obviously, this relationship is the most important in the world right now. Um, if struggle with the West is sort of baked into Xi Jinping's worldview, how much difference can meetings like this make? What, what will be the long-term impact of it? Yeah, I think we need to be very clear-eyed about this because um, the notion of a struggle for the future of the international system uh, is not a phrase which comes from Biden. It's a phrase which comes from Xi Jinping. And the 2014 um, Central Work Conference on Foreign Affairs, maybe it was 2013, uh, he coined the phrase uh, a struggle for the international order. Mm -hmm. And so, and since then, it basically formed the headwaters, if you like, of this much more assertive Chinese foreign security policy, bilaterally, regionally, globally. And there are think tanks at work now on the question of what would a Chinese-led international system look like in practice? So whether we like it or not, that's the reality. That's what's underway. So the question of US-China relations is, how, therefore, do you manage it, <laughs> uh, given that uh, you have the Chinese wanting to do that, the Americans wishing to retain a US-led and um, militarily and economically dominated international system, and with the rest of the world lining up accordingly, hence why we talk about an emerging binary order. So where does Summitry come in with this? I think it's along these lines. On the critical flashpoint question of Taiwan, my own analysis is that neither side now wants a war over Taiwan. Mm. And the reason for that is not because of a lack of nationalism. The reason for that is because both sides are concerned they might lose militarily quite apart from the monumental economic catastrophe globally, which would come from a full-scale uh, military encounter in the Taiwan Straits. And for those reasons, I think that logic underpins where Xi Jinping and Biden got the other day uh, in Bali, which is a decision between them, however inelegantly put, uh, to put a floor under this relationship now for what I describe as the short to medium term. Xi Jinping's readout talks about the need to protect the relationship uh, from crisis and conflict using feng hu. That's a new word uh, that he's used in this context. He's talked about the need for the relationship to have the relationship to have something called a national security safety net, an anquan wang. That's a new word as well. Mm -hmm. So I think what both sides are trying to do is conceptually and then operationally form some guardrails to prevent accidental crisis and conflict and war for what I describe as the short to medium term, which is out, I think, for this term, the next five years. Mm -hmm. But for the medium to long term, the plan is still in Xi Jinping's mind to bring Taiwan within Chinese national sovereignty. And the military is being prepared accordingly. So the real debate for, the, for what I describe as from late 20s to early 30s on is does he proceed with that? Or, does, or do the United States, its allies, and the Taiwanese, by military and technological and financial and economic means, deter the Chinese from doing that if the risk then is still too great? I think that's where we're up to. Jim, you wanted to say? Well, one thing we should probably also bring up is the agreement with Russia. Mm -hmm. China's got to sort out what that means to the world and what it means to China itself. That 5,000-word agreement signed three weeks before the invasion of Ukraine promising alliance that is far beyond the Cold War, um, uh, no limits. Um, basically, Xi and Putin have met 40 times. They're, they're, they're the closest world leaders with each other. 
I think they plan to grow old together, staying in power a long time, and making the world safe for their form of government. I mean, what Kevin's talking about. If you look at the lead-up of what she has said over the last 10 years, and, and, and so I think they also feel an existential threat from the democracies. Democracy is an existential threat. That's why Putin's so worried about Eastern Europe, and, and, and China's worried about the Pacific. They want to protect their, their near near shore areas. Um, but that is hanging over the world. The China, uh, China has now hooked itself to a pariah. And they're saying, we don't want this invasion. There should be peace. But if you look what the diplomats are doing, they are going around the world and they are very much, this is a long-term partnership and agreement to make the world safe for themselves and for them to start um, making the rules. Um, I mean, she in the last in the last ten years has talked about how it's time for a once in a century opportunity um, that to basically remake the world order in the 21st century the way the U.S. did in the 20th. Vladimir Putin has blown that up right now. You know, things were going pretty well because they looked at Europe being messed up and the U.S. being divided. Uh, Ukraine has united NATO and united America on a purpose, and so uh, and China is now, that's hanging on China's neck and they got to figure out what to do with it. Right. Would you agree, Kevin? Yeah, 30 second addition to that is that the view still at the top in Beijing that Russia equals a net strategic asset for China mm -hmm. against a whole range of measures, foreign security policy, commodities and the rest. Um, and that's a deep strategic calculus. What we're saying is people who like China and are frankly supportive of uh, a uh, constructive role for China in the region and the world is the reverse, is that Russia now reps represents a massive strategic encumbrance for China for the future. And if you doubt that, put yourself in the positions of Berlin, Paris, Brussels, London, the rest of Europe, now asking themselves this question, why has China, for example, at the Bali summit, uh, sided with Russia to prevent a simple communique from expressing the empirical fact that there has been a Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the Europeans go back to, to Europe and say, what the hell was all that about? And so the idea that this is good for China's long-term global strategy, I think, is a wrong idea. And Beijing, as you've just been suggesting, need to um, reflect deeply on that. All right, I think we just have a couple of minutes left. So I'm just going to ask one question I want you all to, to answer in your own way in just 30 seconds or less. Um, any leader of China right now would face the same structural headwinds, population decline, slowing growth, so on and so forth. Do the changes that we saw last month make China stronger or weaker in facing those, those headwinds? Dep Depends you? what the, um, the, 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 the sole leader does. All the power is now in Xi Jinping's hands and uh, he owns everything. So if uh, it depends on his decisions and what he does. It's pretty clear. My response is that what they've done over the last five years from the 19th Congress to this is to generate for the first time a debate in the world about so-called peaking China. Is China now peaking because of this quite significant changes in the growth model? So therefore, if he flips that into a more pragmatic direction under, I agree with you, um, Tammy, a highly competent and business-friendly uh, premier in Li Chang, then don't write China off. I think those who are believing that um, China has now peaked are way ahead of the reality. Those who think that China doesn't face massive headlines now are ignoring reality. But the ball lies in the hands of those guys there. Um, and will ideology, as I said before, triumph over pragmatic economic direction or the reverse? So that wasn't 30 seconds, but that's my answer. <laughs> All right. Tammy, you have 22 yeah, seconds. Okay. <laughs> I think with this uh, stronger or weaker, it's not for us here to, to judge at this stage. I think it all depends on, you know, with all the powers in his hands and, with, uh, you know, he's already the core of the leadership. It's a, definitely, he's a very powerful leader. It all depends on how China, how he leads China to tackle all the difficulties, because the difficulties and the uncertainties and the challenges are also very, very daunting. And I think that's for 
the whole world to judge. And only when China can overcome all these uh, difficulties and handle the China-US relations well, and people can come up with the proper judgment. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us here this morning. Yeah. Good. Good.